it's not just me. <laughs> We're slightly panicking with the technology. It's nice to see you all. I, no, it's I, worse I, from Canada, Didi. It's worse yeah. from Canada. So you're okay. not the worst one off. You're your second worst one off. <laughs> I can live with that. <laughs> Very good. Okay. So we are about it's to start, please. Very good. So I, I was just told that we are online finally, uh, despite all the technical difficulties. Uh, so welcome uh, to our next European Values Talk. Uh, this is a public event uh, hosted by European Values Center for Security Policy. Uh, and uh, today we will speak about Huawei and uh, the national security implications. Uh, let me very briefly introduce our speakers who, who, who joined us today. Uh, so the first one speaking will be Charles Barton, who is actually a senior fellow at McDonald Laurier Institute in Canada and also at European Value Center with us in Prague. And Charles will actually present the report he wrote and which we actually right now launched on, on, uh, on this issue. Uh, the second speaker will be actually Didi Kirsten Tatlov. Uh, she is a senior fellow at DGAP and at Synopsys, uh, and she's sitting in Berlin right now. Uh, the third speaker will be Edward Lucas, who is a senior fellow at SIPA, uh, and he'll be speaking to us from London. Uh, the next speaker will be uh, Jerker Hellström, for, who is a director of the Swedish Center for China Studies, sitting in Stockholm. And the last but not, not least, it will be Martin Rasser, from, who is a senior fellow at the Technology, Technology and NATO Security Program at the Center for New American Security. So we'll actually get a very, uh, let's say, transatlantic view from US, Canada, Sweden, Germany, uh, Czech Republic and the UK. Uh, so Charles, uh, I would like to ask you to start, if you could, uh, and briefly tell us what, what is your report about, and then we will discuss it all. And just before you start, I want to tell our, our uh, viewers that they can actually ask questions if they are follow seeing us uh, on YouTube. Below uh, the YouTube video, there is a link to Slido, and there you could post questions. I'll be giving uh, and I'll be handing them to our speakers as well do, after Charles actually opens this discussion with with his presentation. So, Charles, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Jakob. Um, the paper is entitled Huawei's Geostrategic Role, and uh, it starts off with a discussion of Huawei's corporate structure and the relationship to the People's Republic of China's uh, state, military, and security apparatus. And essentially what I point out is that, of course, the Huawei corporate organogram shows the Communist Party branch and its party secretary, Zhou Daichi, at the apex of the corporate pyramid. And I argue that because of its role as an integral element of uh, the United Communist Party regime, uh, Huawei's primary purpose is not to generate profit, but to serve the overall interests of the Chinese Communist Party at home and abroad. And Huawei can reciprocally draw on the PRC, party state, military and intelligence services to obtain technology and data to its competitive advantage. And Huawei is also fully supported by the Chinese Communist Party's extensive United Front Work Department operations coordinated by the PRC's embassies and consulates uh, abroad. So Huawei is mobilized by the Chinese Communist Party to serve PRC regime geostrategic goals throughout the world. Now, um, the second section of the paper talks about Huawei's collaboration in Chinese state surveillance and espionage. And I quote from uh, Huawei Europe's uh, um, publicity entitled uh, A Truly Global Culture. And it says uh, there that everywhere Huawei operates, it abides by the local laws. Huawei also observes the conventions of the United Nations which is uh, quite a corporate social responsibility claim. Um, but, you know, this part of the paper argues the moral um, reasons for why uh, installing Huawei into um, uh, national telecommunication systems is a bad idea. And I, I talk about the massive surveillance program against the Uyghurs and other Turkic Muslim peoples living in China's Northwestern Territory. Uh, Huawei's role in the dystopian social credit program, Huawei's complicity 
in uh, the firewall and internet censorship. Um, Huawei's export of technologies of censorship and extreme surveillance uh, to dictatorships throughout the world through the digital Silk Road program and the pervasive use of Huawei technologies for cyber espionage. And moreover, Huawei has been charged at various times with fraud, obstruction of justice and the theft of um, trade secrets, intellectual property and proprietary manufacturing processes. So the question is, do nations wish to transfer resources uh, to the Chinese state by purchasing Huawei software and hardware from a company whose corporate behavior has been so morally egregious that's complicit in enabling the use of digital technologies in ways that are counter to Western liberal values and indeed the liberal principles that inform the United Nations conventions that Huawei speciously um, promises to uphold. Then I uh, go into Huawei's role in the Belt Road Initiative and in Xi Jinping's community of the common destiny of mankind. Um, and I suggest that gaining support for Huawei's installation of 5G international telecommunications mm -hmm. systems is considered critical to the um, um, PRC regime because getting the 5G telecommunications uh, dominated by a Chinese uh, state champion has the potential to facilitate massive transfer of data to China through analysis by sophisticated artificial intelligence algorithms that would allow for identification of potential targets for espionage and United Front work, but also because uh, this would facilitate PRC knowledge of critical digital infrastructure, including key resources such as uh, water, electricity, internet service, and so on, and the capacity to install kill switches into Huawei digital pipelines would provide China with key advantage. And um, you know, the offering of Huawei technology to China-friendly dictatorial rulers also allows those rulers to sustain their political power by surveillance against potential dissidents and restricting the flow of information to oppressed peoples. And all of this would render those nations amenable and beholden to China's authoritarian Communist Party regime. Um, then I talk about how Huawei is promoting uh, the 5G globally. Um, for one thing, you know, we have evidence that's given in the paper of multiple Chinese state subsidies to Huawei, hundreds of millions of dollars in grants, heavily subsidized land for facilities, building and employee apartments, massive state loans, and Chinese state banks providing favorable loan terms to third world nations buying Huawei installations. And in addition, Huawei has a history of covertly copying competitors' hardware and software and purloining proprietary manufacturing processes. And the Huawei puts considerable resources into engaging persons of political influence, such as former politicians and senior political staffers, to lobby governments to accept the Huawei 5G. Um, in a document that the Huawei company provided to the government of Canada, um, it says, and I quote, Huawei agrees no information shall ever be provided to any foreign intelligence agency outside of Canada. Huawei agrees to never implant or allow others to implant in its equipment or to collect intelligence for any individual organization, including any government organizations, uh, agencies and entities. And furthermore, the document confirms that uh, Huawei has never had any legal or moral obligations to implant or allow others to implant espionage, communications, kill switches, or other malicious functionalities backdoor to its equipment. So that's the end of the quote. But you know, considering Huawei's uh, reputation for dishonesty and the lack of trustworthiness, um, one uh, can't take much uh, suggestion by this statement except that the opposite could well be true. Um, now, the uh, the U.S. intelligence um, has a lot of information on Huawei's 5G challenge to domestic and global security. The U.S. is concerned 
and I quote, the potential loss of control over U.S. critical infrastructure, the independent system of electric power grids, banking and finance systems, natural gas, oil and water systems, and rail and shipping channels, each of which depend on computerized control systems. The U.S. House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence has further concerns over Chinese motivations and their capacity to maliciously modify or steal information from government and corporate entities in order to gain access to expensive and time-consuming research and development that would advance China's economic position on the world stage. Um, so the U.S. says that for operational reasons, though, the U.S. intelligence gathered to proffer the evidence supporting these claims has to be kept from public disclosure because it's classified. But the U.S. has made it clear to its Five Eyes Intelligence Alliance um, that the U.S. cannot entrust secret information to any partner that allows Huawei 5G into its national communications network. In terms of how the U.S. is um, is countering uh, um, Huawei, um, the first thing U.S. did was impose travel bans in July 2020 on employees of Huawei and other Chinese companies the U.S. determines are assisting authoritarian governments in cracking down on human rights, including in China's Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. In September 2020, the U.S. enacted a ban that prohibits any company from selling semiconductors to Huawei that rely on U.S. hardware or design software. So you have Japanese firms like Sony, Kyoksa, Renesis, which have supplied an estimated U.S. $14.4 billion in parts to Huawei in 2019, uh, stopping shipments in mid-September 2020. So unless some resolution is made, Huawei could be short of critical components to manufacture headsets and 5G network, network hardware by early in 2021. Um, U.S. has also taken action to deny Huawei access to Google Android apps because um, Huawei cannot manufacture its equipment using um, Chinese chips. They haven't developed those yet, nor can it duplicate the variety, quantity and quality of Android apps available through Google. These measures are crippling to Huawei's global competitiveness. Um, finally, um, my conclusion the future of Huawei 5G in China's geo strategy and the West response. Um, you know, from Canada, one is very much aware of um, the enormous anger that China has expressed over the uh, detainment of the Huawei CFO, uh, Meng Wanzhou, in response to a U.S. extradition request, which I think could be seen as reflective of Chinese resentment over its Huawei plans increasingly being foiled. And as Ms. Meng could be facing a very long prison term in the United States if convicted of multiple charges of fraud, the PRC could well be concerned that she might cut a deal for leniency by revealing to the US authorities the relationship between Huawei and Chinese security and intelligence agencies and the People's Liberation Army. The, you know, the critical imperative to gain control of global telecommunications to serve China's audacious global ambitions is deeply embedded into the penultimate legitimating mission of the Chinese Communist Party, of course. Um, if it's not Huawei, one could expect that in the future, when the PRC is retrenched to self-sufficiency and production of the hardware and software necessary to dominate all international competitors in telecommunications networks, throughout the world that possibly under a different corporate name, the regime will reapply its ambition to dominance and control over global telecommunications to further strive to realize Xi Jinping's scenario of the China dream of the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. So uh, that is roughly speaking what the paper is. It, it's a, a much longer paper and as, uh, with an excellent chart at the end prepared by European Values that shows the status of Huawei 5G and nations around the world. So I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you, um, Jacob. Thank you very much, Charles. I would go ahead right away with Didi. 
Did you are sitting in Berlin uh, and you are following on the European or a German discussion on the 5G and Huawei. So could you tell us what do you see in up to five minutes, if I could ask you? Sure. Um, sorry about all this um, moving around of the screen. Um, I think um, <clears throat> well, it's, it's, it's um, been a very um, long drawn out um, difficult road here with with the issue of 5g um <clears throat> and we're not at the end of it yet and i'm speaking specifically about germany which of course is um <clears throat> excuse me is, is quite standard setting in some ways for much of the eu so it's a sort of a disproportionate importance because of germany's economic strength on the continent of europe um and some of you will be aware of how this entire issue whether or not Huawei was um, suitable for building Germany's 5G kind of began uh, in began in March 2019 so you know nearly two years ago now well a year and a half um, when when the government the federal government and the what's called the Bundesnetzagentur so the um, federal uh, net network agency came up with a uh, preliminary decision, really, uh, in which it decided very clearly not to ban, not to ban any particular vendor. Um, and that, you know, then sparked an outcry. Well, a debate. I mean, an outcry in some quarters, uh, quite defensive, outraged reaction, mm -hmm. other telecoms, for example. Um, but it kicked off the debate here in Germany very effectively, because the Bundesnetzagentur, of course, is a technical agency. Um, the next step, you know, and the, 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 the debate then, of course, was whether it's Huawei is politically safe, whether it's, you know, safe for a society, or whether the national security issues are even being considered at all uh, in, in saying it, in refusing to exclude it. Um, so that then, in by mid-October 2019, so six months later, roughly, um, we had another, um, another form, another uh, version of that early recommendation to not exclude particular vendors that came out on October the 15th um, and this one strangely was even less um, cautious than the initial decision in March and um, it in fact the, the key area really was that the March suggestion if you like which is guiding um, had been that it, that a 5G provider should be tested for trustworthiness, but by October that trustworthiness criteria had gone. So that's a very interesting phase, and I think what happened during that phase, of course, was very heavy lobbying from the telecoms industry here in Germany. We've got Deutsche Telekom, which is continent wide. We've got um, all kinds of um, you know, Telefonica or phone, phone system network operators. And, and I think, you know, the thing in Germany, which is very strong, makes this debate very difficult, is that people tend to approach these issues in a very kind of value neutral way. Um, they would, for example, compare, you know, uh, China with the US with Iran and, you know, that there is no real, there's no values based positioning here in or hasn't been for a long time at the top of the government that one can publicly discern um in in some of these key debates of course there are you know issue values issues but um it tends to be a relatively technical technocratic even economistic i would say sort of uh, security free zone and that of course has um long tradition in germany since 1945 when german officials and bureaucrats are simply not trained to think in terms of security uh even national security for them this uh, is you know the connection between security and military is unnerving and they don't want to go there but that is slowly changing in germany and there's are in fact efforts to to train bureaucrats and officials to think more in security terms which i think is is necessary but it's going to take time so basically um we then, you know, um, at the point where we're still waiting for a final say on what exactly is going to happen. But what I heard in the um, in a in a German ministry that had heretofore been very very gung ho about using Huawei about China um, overall. I mean, really, really pushing 
um, forward in those directions of full kind of flagrant, um, untrammeled cooperation, if you like. What I heard from some very senior uh, officials there was recent, quite recently, was that um, in fact, it's going to be virtually, it's going to be basically made impossible on a technical level again there will no be be no open conflict there'll be no open challenge for germany that's the american way the germans uh don't want to go down that road um but it will be excluded on on a technical level and um you know there are uh, quite a few interesting things have happened along this road and um one of them has been a report that um, I, again, sort of got confidentially, has not been publicly uh, acknowledged, but that when this shift against Hua using Huawei in Germany 5G began in 2019, that a very, very major uh, telecoms provider here in Germany went into secret talks. That much has been kind of reported already with Huawei. Um, and came to a deal, and the details of this deal have not been reported, and they are as follows, that um, that essentially Huawei would subsidize the German telecommunications company for losses incurred by having to reduce Huawei's participation. Therefore, the German telecommunications company would have to pay more money for more expensive equipment from elsewhere, cancel contracts, all kinds of stuff. Um, and that Huawei would effectively subsidize it against these losses in order for continued support for like 50 percent of, of, of to provide 50 percent of the equipment. Um, you know, originally they had hoped for 75 percent. Well, originally they hoped for 100 percent, but then it went down to 75. And then this deal was supposed to ensure them 50 percent. So, you know, and the people who tried to report on this were, as far as I am told, and I can't confirm this myself, were essentially threatened with a lawsuit if by the telecommunications company if this was made public um so uh, you know from a security point of view it's really by the skin of the teeth that this um didn't happen because clearly the notion of huawei essentially indirectly subsidizing a german te telecommunications company to to use its equipment um in in such in such a direct manner is is distressing to say the least um I think you know more broadly in Europe, it's 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 been you know it's been an incredibly mixed picture. You all know that, um, and um, so I was uh, you know interested to see this suggestion from Brussels. I think it was that in fact um, liability for you know for these in these issues should be transferred to the board members of major telecommunications companies, in in for example in Germany. And I cannot help but wonder whether that's tied also to an effort to get them to take responsibility um and it's a very direct um, attempt i would say so you know we're still in a situation of of um of wait and see i think um i think charles's points you know the the, the major political points are all they're relevant everywhere that's clear um they're not different in europe um the concern of course is that in europe the company has been able to make different inroads in different places and that this that China's impact on such a vital part of technology national securities communicate national security and communications will increasingly drive difference and um uh, and, and be as kind of a centrifugal force in Europe sort of creating conflict between nations who have different interests and I you know I think we'll see how they manage that but um it it, it, it could be a really um you know, I don't think we're sort of out of the woods on that one yet. Ironic, of course, because we have um, some of the big potential telecommunications equipment suppliers. Um, but one other point I think worth mentioning here in the European context is that um, it's something of a puzzle why um, these companies, the uh, Nokia Ericsson's, haven't really um, been more pushy about jumping at this uh, business opportunity, if you like to offer um a, a real alternative to to huawei um that's something that people maybe don't fully understand uh, why it's, and maybe uh, uh you know i'll stop there maybe yaka um who is of course from sweden would have more to say on whether that's a fair comment and you know and, and what the reasons might be thank you yeah. 
Thank you very much, Judy. Thank you for giving us the overview on Germany, which is clearly the most important country on the con in continental Europe on Huawei, and, and that decision will actually, um, imp uh, let's say, influence many other smaller countries, including my own Czech Republic. Um, so let's go. Let's go to London, Edward. Uh, what do you think about the report which Charles actually presented? Well. First of all, I think the report is 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 excellent, um, as one would expect from, from Charles. But I I think the way you've uh, both in terms of collating all the open source evidence um, that we have and joining the dots and highlighting the centrality of this sort of geostrategic mission instead of the the profitability um, is is absolutely central. I suppose that the the main thing we have in Britain about Huawei is that we have a bit of our um, intelligence agency GCHQ, which supervises a um, what's called a cell, um, which is a centre in the provincial English town of Banbury, to examine Huawei's hardware and software. This was started off in because of some concerns more than I think, 15 years ago about the way in which some of the Huawei switches were behaving. They seemed to be communicating with each other in a way that wasn't um, entirely straightforward. And this cell every year produces a report on Huawei. And it's interesting, they have not found any kind of smoking gun about um, actual uh, loopholes or backdoors or trapdoors or anything um, that's a, sort of explicitly, they could explicitly characterize as sinister in um, Huawei products. What they have done is repeatedly noted, uh, noted the inadequacies of these products, um, the failure to document properly how the software is written, um, the kind of you know, high speed shoddiness of the way in which uh, Huawei operates, which of course may disguise um, latent vulnerabilities that only become clear um, in um, future circumstances, which we can't at the moment uh, test, test for. I think more broadly, I'm encouraged by the way the discussion is going. And I think that this is a, this is a battleground on which I feel um, quite happy to fight. Um, it's much easier than, for example, dealing with, if you have an industry as the Australians have, where one third of its exports go to China and the Chinese overnight say, we're not going to um, accept any more, in this case, Australian wine. And you get very sharp political pressure from a very strong lobby. And obviously, we should all be buying Australian wine in future to try and do what we can to blunt the impact of that. But you know, th there you have very specific um, jobs, employment, um, uh, exports at risk. And with Huawei, the push against Huawei is, is sacrificing something, some future cost and convenience that we don't have at the moment. Maybe there'll be some impact on our phone bills or so on, but it's, it's, it's a price that's easier, um, I think is easier to pay. It's also something that chimes with existing fears. We have a lot of worry about privacy and um, the security of our data. So the public's kind of aware of that. And if they don't like their own governments um, snooping on them, they like foreign governments snooping on them even less. So it's it's kind of instantly, um, it's instantly weaponizable. This, 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 uh, this, these point, these points against Huawei um, are good to get across. Uh, I think, and I think that I'm encouraged that despite all the anti-American sentiment that's been so around for ages, but has particularly inten intensified during the uh, Trump administration, that we've still managed to see um, the, you know, the, the, the a broad international coalition taking shape of people who say we don't want this on our network, and this the idea of the clean the clean network, along with things like Blue Dot and other you know, three C's and these other initiatives. I think that uh, the sort of multilateral coalitions of the willing, um, of the scared or the concerned, but these coalitions are, are taking taking shape. And one can see how more countries are going to join. I would love to see more vigorous leadership, um, as was mentioned earlier, from Nokia and Ericsson and Samsung. And I think that the, the we need to get the message across that if you are saying no to Huawei products, you're not saying no to modernity or the Internet of Things or 5G or any of the sort of supposedly good new things that are being offered. Um, and I think we could sh sharpen up the um, alternative offerings 
a bit on that. But I still think it's it's it, this is a good fight to have. I think it would be much harder actually to fight against BRI if BRI projects worked. Actually, they often don't. But if you had high quality, low cost, um, well imagined, well engineered inf infrastructure, um, which other countries weren't or other multilateral development banks weren't producing, that's a much harder sell. Um, but with so I think on um, both sort of strategically and tactically in terms of the um, technology and the alternatives, the way the diplomacy is working, um, I would say to Huawei, bring it on, try and make your argument. And perhaps the final point I'd make is that the, um, the, 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 the greatest weakness for Huawei is that when the Chinese state defends them, it gives the lie to the idea that they're just a humble worker cooperative founded by this um, genius engineer. And when you see, um, for, as we've just seen with Sweden, the threats to Swedish companies exporting to China. If you ban Huawei in Sweden, we're going to whack your exports. Well, then it becomes very clear you're not dealing with just another Chinese company or dealing with an, an outgrowth of the um, party military state, as Charles has, has argued. And in a way, that makes our, our case much, much stronger. Thank you very much, Edward. I just want to comment that in the Czech Republic, we have exactly seen this. So uh, in December 2018, when the Czech cyber agency, actually a cyber security agency, warned against Huawei and ZTE, which was claiming to be a private company, uh, right, right away what happened was that the Czech prime minister was summoned into an emergency meeting with the Chinese ambassador and many um, threatening and quite often even blackmailing uh, suggestions were made by the Chinese government against the Czech Republic. So they basically proved the point that there is a, there's a lot at stake for the CCP, for the Chinese Communist Party, if Huawei is actually, for example, uh, discussed in a national security matter in, in even smaller countries like the Czech Republic. Um, so I'll stop here and uh, I'll give the, the floor to Jerker, who is actually sitting in, in Stockholm. And we clearly see how Sweden is actually taking many leads in Europe on China and on, on, on 5G as well, uh, which is very encouraging. So Jerker, what do you see and why, why are the Swedes so good at this? Actually, to begin with, I, I think uh, it's important to, to remember that uh, the toolbox uh, came in early early this year, and what Sweden is doing right now is just read on. So, in the end, it's actually not a Swedish decision, but it's a European decision. Um, so we basically just follow up on what uh, is not a decision by Brussels, but by the individual member states uh, collectively, right? Um, so, and and then um, touching on Huawei, actually. I think sometimes it can be uh, a little bit tricky to pin down um, who we're actually talking about. And I, I would like to say that the Swedish decision here is not really about Huawei or, or Zhongxing or ZTE, but it's about China. Uh, and I think that's uh, important to keep in mind. Um, and, and there is a problem of imaging for Huawei in this case, uh, because it, uh, suddenly it, it, it seems as if it becomes a party, but also part of the party, uh, so to speak, being, I mean, um, drawn in uh, by the intelligence law of 2017, which is, you know, commonly referred to as one of the main issues. It's, it's basically stating what we already uh, knew, um, but, but you know, having it in black and white certainly doesn't work in, in Huawei's favor. Um, and, and, and you also mentioned um, these uh, threats of repercussions coming from tr Chinese authorities uh, towards Swedish companies. I mean, that's that's what's been said. I, I don't think it's still, uh, I don't know if you should refer to them as, as threats because it's been actually quite low key, I, I would say, uh, the, the response. Um, but that makes it even harder for, for Huawei to argue that it's separate from from uh, at least the Communist Party's sphere of interest. Um, I mean, no matter if it's it's a, a private company company or not, or how do you view it? Um, so actually, just uh, some two two questions or, or comments on on uh, Charles' uh, report here, which I, I find really interesting. Uh, I mean, being from Sweden, of course, uh, I would be 
uh, really interested in, in in this list uh, at, at the end of the report, including others than, than NATO member states, um, and uh, to see what sort of what what the what the map is in in, in Europe and and, and elsewhere, um, and also uh, on the position coming from from the company Huawei. Uh, I mean, what kind of arguments uh, is the company making, and to what extent? Do those arguments hold any water whatsoever? I mean, in some cases, um, these are arguments that are fair, but actually are not really, shouldn't be part of the discussion. Uh, if, if you look at what's happening in, in Sweden, um, when when um, when the company is um, sort of speaking up for, for itself, it's, I mean, it's, it's uh, saying uh, correctly that uh, it's been in Sweden since uh, uh, 20 years back uh, when it was launched in Sweden as Atelier Telecom, which was the first name when, when it was uh, entered the Swedish market. Um, it's you know it's contributed to uh, the digitalization of Sweden and and, uh, and so on. And, and it, uh, Huawei has all these um, reports that it, the company has commissioned from from uh, various. Um, companies um and uh you know the, to some extent there's merit to what it's saying but it's really not part of this question here i mean to the extent uh, to what extent that uh the company has you know been uh, positive for sweden that's not the issue the issue is about uh national security um i just uh to, to just a few points and, and i mean i'm happy to take questions on, on what's been happening in sweden but um I mean, as I'm not a technical expert, I won't, I won't you know, go into those uh, issues, but I mean, <clears throat> to begin with, uh, I think it's important also to keep in mind what's happening in China. Uh, China should know, uh, you know, uh, that there are reasons to look at your national security when, when um, making decisions on your uh, uh, vital infrastructure. Um, and um, that's also why China has the term cyber sovereignty, um, which is, you know, it's about non-interference. And what China is doing now, it seems very much to me like interference in Swedish uh, domestic decision making. Um, and I don't see actually many people raising that, that point. Um, Adam Siegel at the Council of Foreign Relations um, uh, says that cyber sovereignty represents a pushback against the notion that cyber security, as I said, sorry, that cyber space should be a free, open, and global platform. Um, and that, you know, this is, uh, yeah, this is the pushback, uh, what, what China's doing. But in terms of Sweden, um, as I said, this is all based on the toolbox um, coming from the um, Cooperation Group on Network and Information Security uh, of the member states, the EU member states, um, in, which was launched in, in January, um, which included rec recommendations for member states uh, in terms of uh, restricting suppliers considered to be high risk and even excluding uh, uh, vendors in, in key assets defined as critical. So that's where it comes from. Uh, there was uh, some changes made in um, the Electron Electronic Communications Act uh, earlier this year. Um, and as a result of that, we're now seeing that the decision uh, on 5G, which is not by the Swedish government, is, is by the telecoms uh, authority, is based importantly on assessments by the security service and the armed forces. Um, so, uh, these are not issues concerning, uh, you know, the ability for, of Sweden to um, roll out 5G uh, or, uh, you know, economic or, or financial decisions. It's about national security in the end. Uh, and I think it shouldn't be come as a surprise because if you look at what the security service has said in its annual reports, um, it's saying that China is one or not if not the most um, uh, biggest threat um, when it comes to uh, cyber uh, operations against Sweden. So cyber espionage. Um, what it's saying in its assessment to the telecoms authority 
um, is that it's witnessed uh, an increase in Chinese cyber espionage targeting the service sector, and, and it's specifically saying that this the service sector includes um, the telecom operators. Intelligence gathering on infrastructure for electronic communication can be used to map a state's civilian infrastructure or to acquire or transfer civilian technologies. So I guess in, in the Swedish debate, to the extent there is an informed debate about these issues, uh, this relates um, to also the, the debate about um, screening uh, investment, foreign direct investment uh, in Sweden. Uh, and I should also add, this is not directed uh, explicitly at any, you know, <clears throat> state. But it's uh, of course when we talk about high-risk vendors, then uh, uh, based on the fact that the, the the security service has identified it from China, it of course applies uh, to China. Um, it also says that Chinese intelligence law again uh, gives the intelligence services a, a broad mandate to operate also outside China. Uh, by all necessary means. Um, and so um, that's also interesting. Another talking point from Huawei is that the intelligence law does not apply to Chinese businesses overseas. Uh, I haven't seen that in any uh, law or regulation, but according to Huawei, it does not apply to them um, when they're operating overseas. Um, I have more to say, but I'll just stop there to continue the discussion. Thanks. Thank you very much, Erika. I think it's, it's good to see your view from Sweden. And I would uh, go right away to, to the other side of the Atlantic, to Martin, who is sitting in the, in the CNIS, and he's been studying a lot on how is it going over there. So Martin, could you also maybe address a bit over if, and I'm saying if uh, Joe Biden wins the presidency, what would be your expectation over the USG policy on Huawei and 5G? Because we have seen a very aggressive approach by President Trump's administration, uh, which brought a lot of fruit, but also upset it many people in Europe, which used this uh, this aggressive uh, style of President Trump as an excuse while to turn a blind eye on Huawei. That's I think what's quite relevant in a couple of European countries at least. So what would you expect, if I may ask as well, if uh, Vice President Biden would win the presidency on Huawei as well? Martin, yeah. yeah, absolutely, Jakob. Thank you uh, so much. And uh, so um, I'll address that specific question um, in just a second, but I want to just give uh, some higher level uh, comments first, just to, to frame um, my thoughts. Um, first of all, I, I would uh, really want to commend uh, Charles for this very comprehensive and thorough report. Uh, it's a great resource for policymakers, but also for the general public and to really have a one-stop shop um, for a document that lays out all these issues very cogently and provides solid evidence for all of this. So it's a very valuable uh, contribution to the to the broader 5G debate. Um, what I think is really important about it is that it shows concerns over Huawei are widespread and also longstanding. So this isn't something that just materialized during the Trump administration. And, and frankly, the United States was a little late to the game in understanding the implications of having untrusted vendors on your 5G networks. Uh, the Australians you know, deserve all the credit for being the thought leaders. And of course, the Czech Republic has done a lot. Uh, the 5G security conferences in Prague, for example, have done a great deal, uh, particularly in Europe, to advance the understanding of, of what the threat ultimately is. I think this also clearly shows that it's not about one Chinese company, right? It's not just about Huawei. We're talking about a strategic competition with an authoritarian regime. So it's an economic competition. It's a political one. It's a military one. It's technological. It's diplomatic. And it's also an ideological competition. And that's this broader framework that we have to think about these issues. in. to go specifically to your question on what um, I anticipate a President Biden would do is still will be very much a hard line on the issue. So you won't see any change in terms of uh, you know the, new, the United States changing its position on Huawei on US networks. That will absolutely not change. I think the biggest differences you'll see is 
how the United States engages with its allies and partners on these issues. So you'll see much more of a shift to cooperative multilateral approaches on the topic. And specifically, one um, one area that, uh, for example, some of his senior advisors have talked about, uh, Tony Blinken, Jake Sullivan, is uh, multilateral approaches to technology policy, where you really start looking at the world um, as a grouping of techno democracies working together to push back against encroaching techno authoritarianism. And so there's a couple of areas where I think, particularly on 5G, that, that has relevance. So yes, it's one thing to, to ban Huawei from your networks and deny Huawei the ability to make advanced uh, radio access network equipment, but that still leaves you with a fairly inefficient telecommunications industry, right? Because if you exclude Huawei, you're looking at Nokia, Ericsson, Samsung as the the primary providers of RAN equipment. And that's, that limited vendor choice presents vulnerabilities and risks in its own right. One area that I think holds a lot of promise and one where uh, various governments working together is to look for technological alternatives and, and open RAN, um, so where you have open interfaces on the radio access network, that's increasingly seen as a, as a viable alternative. So our um, allies in Japan, for example, are already building out very comprehensive 4G and 5G networks based on open RAN. So this is an area where, yes, there's still importance to protect your technological edge, but here's an opportunity to really out-innovate China, out-compete China uh, in a way that's economically sound um, and, and helps boost uh, the economies of, of each uh, allied country, but specifically allowing new companies to enter the market, which I think particularly in Europe would be very appealing given that concept of uh, digital sovereignty, right? So imagine uh, British and Czech and Swedish and French and German software companies entering this new market uh, then you have much greater opportunity for uh, an effective counterbalance to uh, Chinese prominence in this. The other area, and this is something that um, that Edward uh, touched on earlier as well, is you know Huawei is still making very strong inroads in a lot of countries in the world. If you look at South America, Africa, now increasingly Southeast Asia, that also poses risks to us. Um, and so we have to think, uh, more smartly about um, alternative investment mechanisms so that you have a sustainable and secure alternative to the digital Silk Road initiatives. And, and here again, I think is something where a, a Biden administration would be very much at the forefront of working with Europe and uh, the allies in the Indo-Pacific to come up with new investment mechanisms that don't place these countries in debt trap diplomacy and and help them build digital infrastructure that that is sustainable and comports with our liberal democratic values. So I think that's um, two areas where I would anticipate a Biden administration to really reach out to the allies around the world and and hopefully collaboratively move forward to creating a technology future that's that's much more beneficial and ultimately in our collective long-term interest. So um, I'll leave it at that because I know uh, there's people that have a lot of questions and uh, you know, very much looking forward to this conversation. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Martin. Uh, I would ask our, you, our dear speakers, if any of you have comments or questions to each other, I think if we can spare a couple of those. And then we have already several questions waiting through Slido. So if you are tuning into this discussion now, you could go to, and you are following this on YouTube, just see be below the YouTube clip, you'll see a link to Slido, which is an application which will allow you to, to pose a question directly. We already have three, three here and I'll pose them in a second. But first, I wanna give the floor to our speakers. I see Didi waves her hand. So Didi, please go ahead and ask or comments on any of us. Thank you, uh, Yaakov. Um, Charles, I also wanted to add my um, appreciation to you for cutting through the thicket of so much of this 
Huawei stuff. It's been, you know, it's been a yeah, um, road for a lot of people and it's still a very tough road for Canada, that's for sure. Uh, you've got that awful situation there um, with um, with the two Michaels, etc. Um, my question really to you, Charles, was that um, if you were, wanted to comment a bit about the whole Nortel issue, the technology transfer concerns that predated the rise of Huawei, because, well, they came along with it, really, because it's quite fascinating when you look at the um, how, you know, when Huawei took off and became this massive company, it, you know, there, there are these persistent and it seems correct. Um, you know, issues about uh, massive technology theft from Nortel, which, to be fair, didn't do itself any favours through what seems like very egregious and um, sort of self-indulgent management, a lot of management problems, um, for sure, greed, etc., which is a real shame. But, I, you know, my sense is that the US League Light Intelligence Services know actually a heck of a lot about what happened. But for some reason, so many of these details have never come into the public sphere and I wonder why that is do you think well I I, I don't think I can comment on um, uh, classified uh, information but I mean what we know about Martel is um, you know it, it the company crashed uh, dramatically and a lot of Canadians who you know felt that Nortel was a, a stable stock bet lost a lot of money um, but um, the Nortel campus in the northern, um, the western part of Ottawa uh, was subsequently sold to the Canadian Department of National Defence to move their headquarters from downtown Ottawa to this uh, beautiful Nortel campus. And when they um, moved in, they, they had to delay the move considerably because the walls of the, um, of the former Nortel uh, complex were completely riddled with uh, various forms of listening devices and other um, devices designed to uh, purloin uh, data. And so, you know, there are indications that those that those devices were directing information to China. I, I don't think um, that there's any um, direct connection um, in the open information about uh, whether um, Nortel technology was transferred to uh, Huawei, although I believe that there are still still um, investigative uh, reporters looking at things like uh, patents to see if if they can identify uh, Nortel innovations that it's patented by Huawei. So uh, you know, it's uh, it's pretty clear that. Um, that uh, seriously wrong with Nortel, and it appears to have involved the Republic of China. Possible that Nortel, um, part you know, uh, it, uh, helped Huawei to establish itself as a global um, technology leader. But, um, you, you know, there's nothing there that uh, that would allow us to, um, you know, engage in legal action against Huawei and so on up to now. And so I, I think I I leave it there. In general, you know, when you look at intelligence services to look at your larger question, um, you know, at least the ones that I know in Canada, there's a tendency to um, not provide uh, um, information for fear of of revealing their their means of gathering the intelligence. It, it does seem to be a bit of an issue where you know intelligence services like the Canadian Security Intelligence Service may know a lot of things. Um, but they're not transferring them over to agencies that would act on those things and, uh, and um, bring those who are responsible for uh, uh, theft of intellectual property, proprietary manufacturing processes, or indeed people who are um, illegally transferring classified technology to agents of a foreign state to justice. And so, you know, it seems to be a sort of a club of uh, intelligence agencies that share information around with each other but don't actually apply it to the purpose, which is to stop bad things from happening. So, you know, one might see the the Huawei Nortel um, situation in that kind of frame. Mm -hmm. Very good. Any other questions or comments between you here on the panel? Uh, 
looking around if some of you would be waving or winking, no? <laughs> okay, so let's jump to the questions from our audiences. Uh, so uh, the first question, which 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 is here, uh, give me, uh, from uh, Ale Alexi Drew, and he says that uh, he sees that here in the United Kingdom, he see political and policymakers, uh, based on his experience, are becoming becoming tired of discussing Huawei. How do you suggest we maintain their attention? Uh, and I, I think this is something what we might see in many places across Europe, uh, where basically the Huawei discussion might be seen as a kind of a disruption or not something was a, of a strategic value for the country, something more like a kind of a US policy which is imposed on us. That's something what I've heard a lot on in Berlin and other places, which I don't think it is, but how would you react to this, any of you? Yeah, I'd be happy to jump in on that. I would say, you know, focus on the affirmative agenda, right? Uh, so look at what Vodafone just announced, how they are going to emphasize open RAN deployments for their networks. Um, it, it's, it's not about Huawei anymore. It's a matter of building secure and robust 5G networks. And you know, there's plenty of ways to do that. Go to Nokia, go to Ericsson, go to Samsung. And look into open ran as the as a good alternative and that's where the focus should be you know where does the uk want to be with its 5g networks what it what does it want to accomplish um think of the economic growth that goes with it that that's the real story it's not about keeping huawei out anymore it's about building a positive technology future for yourself that's that's where the emphasis should be mm -hmm. thank you uh, Edward, please go ahead. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I, I I remember the Cold War quite clearly, and the first sort of line of defence in the Soviet Union and their apologists was say you're wrong, and then the second line was to say you're boring, and I think that um, you know, we may be or some some people in the West may be tired of Huawei, and tired tired of uh, Chinese technological and other aggression, but unfortunately the people in Beijing are not tired of you. And so I think that we have just to you know, keep 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 pushing on, and that there is a, and I think it's it, the, the the data imperialism, if one can call it that, the way in which um, different aspects of the um, Chinese system are hoovering up enormous amounts of data about individuals in the West, whether through um, sort of hacks like we saw at the OPM, or possibly through. Um, collecting um, faces and mobile phone data and credit references and so on through open source acquisition. Um, but the, 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 the realization is growing that this surveillance inside China is only the inward looking bit. There's also kind of outward looking um, surveillance and that that really concerns people. And I think that there's going to be, uh, the, the more we find out about that and with this database fragment that was just um, leaked a few weeks ago and has been analysed and just beginning to get a sense of how much data the Chinese authorities hold on individuals, many of whom have absolutely nothing to do with China. And, and, and Huawei is part of that. Um, because Huawei enable, en is an enabler for that that sort of um, collection of personal data, and so I think we, the, the issue will stay live and not tiring and not boring um, for many months and years to come. If I could just add a couple of things here, I mean, I think people have to appreciate that access is the key to hacking, and you know Huawei facilitates that. But I think that there's also um, the activities of Huawei in different countries in terms of influence, um, um, you know, expanding its influence operations. Uh, the Globe and Mail newspaper here in Canada um, recently received some documents um, from a rogue Huawei employee that shows how the Huawei Chinese Communist Party branches, uh, United Front Work Department division has been um, uh, cultivating um, key uh, policy makers and uh, what they refer to KOS, I guess, key opinion um, formers. And they, these documents actually show, you know, the, the photographs of the people, the names, their status, and uh, the, the extent to which um, they have been uh, engaged so far. So I think that we need much more openness uh, on this and, and you know, legislation that 
that better defines the boundary between acceptable public diplomacy and um, and uh, improper um, actions by foreign states to try and and achieve their their ends. So, you know, the Australian uh, Foreign Influence Transparency Scheme Act, I think, is something that uh, countries like Canada and others be looking at more closely. I would just say another thing in terms of transparency. I, I, I think uh, building on my previous point, I don't think the U.S. has been um, sufficiently forthcoming in releasing publicly information that they have about uh, bad things that Huawei does. In other words, you know, they've come around to all the countries, particularly the Five Eyes, and uh, you know, given us to some extent uh, information about what U.S. intelligence knows about Huawei. But I don't think that um, that they've paid enough attention to um, trying to. Um, cultivate public opinion to understand more fully the, the danger that Huawei um, uh, poses to really our, our freedom and democracy around the world and, yeah. and the international rules-based order that I, uh, I harp on quite a bit in my paper. Thank you, Charles. Uh, I, I will come up with another uh, question, which comes from Frederick Foy from Sweden. And I will rephrase the question. And basically what he's asking about is that we see China threatening countries if they exclude Huawei from their 5G. And his question is, have you actually seen those threats to be materializing? So is, it, is, the, is China actually punishing countries in real life or is it just talking about it? Okay, so who has seen it? Martin, I see you are going ahead. Yeah, sure. Well, I'd say it's uh, mostly bluster so far. But, um, you know, if you do look at what's happening to Australia, um, you know, that's that's serious. Um, and that's, I, again, why I think uh, if you have the tech leading democracies of the world setting a common front on this, you can do a lot to push back on these attempts at, at economic coercion. And we have to remember, too, we have very important technological advantages over China um, that we can bring to bear as well. If you think, for example, about semiconductors, you know, that's a key advantage um, that ultimately China does not have a good answer for. Um, so I see this more so as, as saber rattling and a lot of noise. But when push comes to shove, we still have uh, you know, the upper hand when it comes to matters like this, but but we do have to be very forceful about pushing back on, on any attempt by Beijing to to enact these kind of measures. Mm -hmm. But you know, there is a significant um, financial implications uh, of not adopting Huawei 5G because the telecommunications companies that have purchased the heavily discounted uh, Huawei equipment, I think, some estimate you know 30 40 percent uh cheaper than than competitors uh, due to chinese state subsidies presumably the the cost for them to not use well is significant because they have to remove um their previous kit to, to make it compatible with say ericsson or nokia 5g so in a way uh, china is already in a subtle way um, disincentive us and you know i think that for the telecommunications companies of the world, they they don't have a mandate to protect national security. Their their operating purpose is to you know maximize profit for their shareholders by getting the the best equipment at the best price. And you know right now with the demand to not use the Huawei 5G, those companies are are feeling. Uh, um, that they're being treated in a way which is um, antithetical to their to their competitive interests and therefore exert pressures on government to ignore the security concerns about Huawei and allow them to to expand into the exciting new 5G technology um, in a way which will not uh, lead to unacceptably high cost to consumers. So, you know, the Chinese strategy has worked well. Um, it's a lot um, um, carefully calculated strategy that that uh, has uh, uh, so far has had a good effect. I think that the, they they had not. I don't think the Chinese regime had expected there to be so much resistance to their plans. But fortunately, it seems that we've uh, you know we're more or less on top of it by now. And and throughout the world, it seems that public of China on People's Republic of China terms. 
Thank you. And Yerker, you wanted to respond to it, right? Sure. Um, I mean, since the question is coming from Sweden, uh, I should, of course, help out with the Swedish perspective as well. And I'd say that, I mean, on, on 5G, the jury's still out. We haven't seen um, much um, in terms of threats materializing. I mean, of course, this all goes back to Australia in, in, in 2012, uh, when was first, um, and, and the first, um, per se, were, were first uh, excluded. Um, um, but, I mean, in terms of these uh, threats, I, I said before that, it's still been quite low-key in terms of uh, sort of the messaging. Um, but I would say also, I mean, we also see reactions from Chinese uh, media, uh, reactions in social media, of course. Um, but in the end, I think from, from the Chinese authorities, I think it's all, to, to a large extent, it's also about messaging to the home audience, basically saying that, um, the, for example, the Chinese uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, is taking... Uh, you know, it, it's, it's looking after its, its companies. And so, um, I mean, um, basically signaling that uh, China will not accept uh, its companies to be excluded from uh, European markets in this case uh, without any uh, repercussions. They won't sit idly by. Um, and yes, I think we'll see, you know, directives from the party center going out to the different parts of the system and making life hard for Swedish uh, officials and companies to some extent. But in the end, I mean, uh, the party will, will uh, I mean, it will have to make some sort of due diligence and try to find out to, to what extent it's actually going to, what is going to gain from this. And of course, Sweden is, if we talk about the 5G decision here, Sweden is not a vital market for the Chinese vendors. Uh, so it's a lot about messaging saying to, for example, the rest of the EU that there will be problems, you know, if you make similar uh, decisions. Um, but it's, at the same time, it makes it harder for China to uh, sort of keep, um, keep, uh, you know, pushing for you know, this um, image of itself as a uh, responsible stakeholder uh, and, and, you know, that being against protectionism and and you know um, uh, even the rules based better, um, but uh, yes, uh, and uh, just to, to add to that, um, if you look at previous threats that have materialized, um, you you can't look at five G per se. You have to look at other issues, and they're totally different from this one because five G is global. The other issues that we've seen previously, if you look at the Nordic region, we have Norway, which was put in the freezer in 2010 uh, because of uh, the Nobel Prize, of course, the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, but what actually came out of that was increasing uh, Norwegian exports to China, uh, which is often forgotten. I mean, the biggest Chinese corporate acquisition ever made in Norway was actually completed during those years. Um, you can, I mean, you could look at South Korea and Chinese reactions to THAAD, um, where uh, Lotte was uh, sanctioned for two years until 2019. Um, but, uh, I mean, in that case, it was Chinese national security. This is not about Chinese national security in the end, at, le at least not that's not how it's portrayed. Um, so, yeah, we we'll, we'll have to see. The jury's still out. Uh -huh. Very good, Jarko. And uh, I think we have a couple of more minutes for a couple of more questions. Uh, the one which we have here, and maybe Martin will be uh, in charge of responding since he is probably the most technically oriented from all of us uh, in a positive way. So the question is from you, uh, Yuan Grant. Uh, how can the new open RAN software upgrade solutions uh, which could be, and how could it be uh, protected? I mean, the question basically is, how can we make sure that the upgrades in the system are actually safe? That's at least how I understand it. But maybe, Martin, if you could also very briefly try to explain, uh, if I could say, for the dummies, what is open RAN? I mean, you spoke about it. I think it's understandable, but I'm not sure everybody really understands it in, in, in like simple terms. So 
if you could just try to simplify it for all of us. And I'll sure. It. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so the the current telecommunications market is is focused primarily on proprietary hardware. Uh, so this radio access network equipment, which is uh, base stations and so forth. Um, and so the issue is that right now th that market is dominated by four companies. So Huawei, Nokia, Ericsson, and Samsung. The issue with this equipment is that it's a black box. So the operators of a telecommunications network don't know what's going on inside that equipment. And this is, of course, um, a security concern when you have an untrusted vendor like Huawei. It also makes it very difficult to be able to have equipment of different vendors on a, on a large portions of a network so you get this vendor lock-in and and that's the reason why if you have huawei equipment from 3g and 4g networks um, it's it's very difficult to then overlay 5g equipment from another vendor on top of that um open ran is is a different approach so this is based on the concepts called network virtualization which basically just means that you do a lot of the functionality that is currently done on hardware that you do that with software. And the premise here is that um, in order for that to be interoperable, you have this common foundation that everyone has visibility into. Um, from a security standpoint, obviously no no network is going to be a, a completely secure. And, and so just like with the software, um, your computers and your personal devices, you will still have to do security audits. But that's much easier to do on a software software based network than it is on a network based on proprietary hardware. And so there's companies like um, like Finite State in the United States, for example, that have demonstrated that you can do uh, security audits of large software based networks at scale in, in near real time. Um, but of course, it, it's not a silver bullet from a security standpoint, but it is a significant improvement. Um, but you would still have to adopt, you know, as a zero trust type of approach to network security, just like you would on your your corporate networks now or your government communications networks. Um, in terms of, uh, uh, let me see, what was the uh, the other part of the question, um, specifically okay. on the viability of on, open on, the, on, on the on the on the on how can we secure the upgrades to the software in open open uh, uh, ran? Uh, yeah, uh, the the same way you would on any mm -hmm. s uh, software updates that that you have in in other networks. Um, so because you have visibility into the code, it's, it would be much easier to detect if there are um, flaws in the code, potential backdoors, those can be patched and fixed before they're actually deployed on the network networks themselves. Um, so I think the, the key benefit is much greater visibility and the fact that you will have many more vendors supplying that type of software you know that just raises the stakes for these companies to have very secure software practices just from a competitive standpoint because you're going to go to the companies that uh you feel most comfortable using their products that that's the biggest advantage and um you know edward had mentioned earlier the uh, arrangement that huawei had with gchq um you know if you if you read the the reports from the British government on their audits of Huawei software, Huawei is very very bad at, at software development. Um, so this is a big advantage of going with the open RAN approach because we already know Huawei is very bad at it and hasn't shown any inc inclination to to improve their practices. And so this is why you know open RAN addresses so much of these concerns that we've been having um it's, it's not perfect but it's definitely much better than the present day situation right thank you uh yeah i would suggest now that we actually go for our concluding remarks and uh one qu my question to all of you is actually if you go could, could go below one minute let's say just for your blood points and the question is what 
would you suggest to be in the next steps on on the Huawei and 5G discussion? Um, and from where you are sitting, you are sitting in each of your capitals. If you could name one, two, maybe three steps ahead, what do you think it would be the right thing to do? Anybody wants to start? I know it's not easy, but I think it's a good way how to end up at a, a real debate on this. Well, I'll, I'll go real quick since I have to jump off for another meeting. Um, mm -hmm. So, so one is, you know, deliberate build outs of secure networks, partnering with allies on ensuring that everyone has a common foundation for secure digital infrastructure. And we also need to think about what comes next. So already looking at beyond 5G technologies, because, the, you know, that that's a decade out. And there's a lot of lessons that we can learn from the 5G experience that we can apply to the next generation of telecommunications so we can avoid a lot of the the headache that we're experiencing today. I think if we plan prudently, we'll be in a much better position um, strategically and technically uh, over the course of the decade. But uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to join you. And uh, Charles, again, uh, congratulations on a fantastic report. And it was uh, great to join everyone. Thank, Thank you. you, Martin. Thank you. Have a nice day. And uh, who who is next? Edward, please. I, yes, I, I, I have to jump off as well because I've got another, another call. So I think there's two things um, I'd say very quickly. One is that this is tailor-made for international cooperation, both in terms of cracking down on um, Huawei and uh, uh, fight promoting alternatives. The other is I would like to see an intelligence service um, take on Huawei as an intelligence target. We should get defectors, people who've been inside Huawei, and come out and talk about what it's really like. I'd love to see an investigative book on Huawei um, based on uh, you know, people who uh, are willing to talk frankly about it. Um, but we should, uh, we, we, we need to t t tell the story um, in a sort of convincing mass market, exciting way, but also inform ourselves as, go as, as governments about what's really going on inside. Thank you, Edward. Thank you, thank you very much for being with us and for these ins insights. And uh, okay. have a nice day. Thank you very much. And then Charles goes ahead. Charles, you are muted. Sorry. Usual problem again. I know. The whole story of the pandemic. Um, I think that uh, for one thing, I know that the Canadian government is considering providing subsidies to firms that have uh, already a lot of Huawei equipment um, to. Uh, to um, go to other suppliers, and that would then um, mean that the cost to the consumer would be reduced. So, you know, the government taking responsibility for allowing those companies to get involved with Huawei in the first place, which, you know, that we're now regretting. Uh, secondly, I think that, as I said before, we should be cracking down more on Huawei influence operations with policymakers. Um, and the activities of their Communist Party branch, and you know that 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 uh, in collaboration with the Chinese state to to um, uh, try and uh, encourage policymakers uh, to agree to Huawei five G, despite the the great concerns. And uh, finally, I think it's important that the Canadian government uh, not um, give in to pressure to release Meng Wanzhou back to Beijing, but should allow the judicial process of the consideration of her extradition request to to go through and if, if it's found that this extradition request is consistent with the canada u.s bilateral um, extradition treaty to remove her to the united states to face uh, um, charges over the uh, uh, alleged uh, crimes that she's committed i think that that would uh, be very helpful in terms of raising public awareness of the nature of huawei's uh, relationship to the regime and the general um you know lack of corporate um trustworthiness and, and compliance with, with norms that appears to be characteristic of how huawei is attempting to to get ahead in its um, international um, goals of dominating global 5g telecommunications thank you charles and is it Yerka or did he going ahead okay okay, okay. Yarker, go ahead, if yeah. you did it as a mind. Thanks, yeah. Uh, 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 great talking to you. And, and um, just uh, some points then. Um, 
I'm, I'm looking a lot about uh, at, the, at the imaging and, and, and the narratives, and I think it's uh, important to keep in mind that this, is, in the end, uh, not about the companies, but about, uh, but, but about uh, China uh, and the Chinese, the, the objectives of the Chinese state. Uh, I mean, no matter if, if a company portrays itself as, as private or not, uh, or if it's state owned, uh, in one case, I mean, this is about China, and I think it's important to study uh, the narratives coming out of China, which you will uh, recognize from, you know, years back. Uh, nothing new is really coming out, but but uh, just to be able to um, uh, to discuss uh, a more informed discussion um, really requires that that we uh, keep in mind what what uh, the, the Chinese state actors uh, actually mean when when they're saying certain things. Another, we have the issue of, of repercussions uh, on the table here, and I think that we should stop talking about repercussions because that that's not really constructive. Um, as as um, Paralink uh, said, you know, it's about the anaconda and the chandelier also, not only in China, but also uh, abroad. Um, you never know when the Chinese states will uh, react um, and, and uh, in, in which ways. Um, so, but, but, Nevertheless, I mean, there will be re repercussions in some cases, um, and and that also leads to the need for uh, foreign corporations uh, with business in, in China and, and um, with China to um, review their exposure uh, to to Chinese um, supply chains uh, and also the market. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying that you know this is all about leaving China. All, uh, Altogether, but but you know diversification, and you know um, being ready for the situations like this one uh, that will they will come up again. Thanks. Thank you, Erica. Thank you very much. And Didi, uh, you go ahead. And I think it would be also good to mention you have a great book on Chinese espionage, which I think fits into this as well. And we haven't really discussed it that much in detail, but I think it's good if you could talk also. Oh, well, just okay, to mention it, go, Paul. Uh, absolutely not my place to do so because this is Charles's uh, amazing report. Um, in that sense, I, I don't want to go too far down that road, but it's very kind of you, Jakob, to to even mention it. Um, but I did want to say, um, yes, there is this book about um, this sort of massive technology uh, spotting and transfer from more developed countries, which has been carried out by China since. 1949, if not before, I think. But I, but apropos, uh, you know, of the main things going forward, I think in Germany in particular, what we need here is a far more aggressive press, uh, far more aggressive media. Um, German media, in my uh, respectful opinion, um, you know, can be okay, but they can also be tame. I think they were very tame. And this is a huge problem. Um, it's very consensus oriented, which is of course not very, you know, doesn't really fit with the idea of the fourth estate. Um, you know, there's the, the economic media, the the, the Wirtschaftsjournalismus is, is a huge area because it's a big economy. Um, and there's a lot of, you know, uh, mutual protection going on and don't tell secrets. And, and I think like some of the things I briefly described with, um, some of the major telecommunications companies here. I mean, they're happening everywhere, but um, you know, you know, actual threats of lawsuits to major media to 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 not report certain things, that kind of stuff, you know. And then it doesn't get out. So first of all, please, a far more critical and courageous uh, media in in this area of dealing with the political realities and the technological and the economic realities in Germany. Very important of uh, this encounter, this epic historical encounter with China and the CPC. Um, but I also wanted to say, um, along with that, we need to deal with elite capture in Germany quickly, you know, and, and thoroughly, that's not happening. Um, in Germany, any donation of up to 10,000 euros to a member of the Bundestag does not have to be logged. So you could, in theory, you know, just divide up, say, a million. And it's, I mean, it's not difficult to have enough people to give in 10 grand each. So no, for example, and then you get to real money there. Um, that's a problem. 
that's also not being talked about very much, by the way, in, 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 in the public. Again, it's this rather cosy kind of, you know, let's just, let's just keep stuff going as it is. So the point I wanted to make, though, um, is to do with comments that Martin said, and I'm sorry he's, he's, he's had to leave, about the multilateral approaches to te technology policy possible under a Biden uh, presidency. And I see that he seems to be doing really well in Georgia. My little screen here says he's just overtaken something in Georgia. So maybe really, really up in the sea of presidency. Um, uh, and I, I just I just wonder what that means exactly, because it's very clear to me sitting in Germany that um, if there hadn't been this absolutely massive pressure bearing down on Europe and other parts of the world from the US over Huawei, I don't think we would be even in a position of waiting for this uh, political requirements and trustworthiness requirements that we're waiting for from the German government, which seem to be, you know, ultimately to be leading to the exclusion of Huawei from 5G here. You know, that, that pressure is incredibly important. And I wonder once that, you know, I wonder what does multilateral approaches to technology policy mean? Because Germany's approaches were certainly very, very different. And if they had been allowed to prevail, um, you know, we're not there yet, like I said, so we'll wait and see. Um, but if they've been allowed to prevail, we wouldn't even be where we are now. So that concerns me somewhat. And I'm also, I would ask the same question, although I'm not a technology expert, but I'd ask the same question about this um, RAN equipment, which sounds very interesting. Um, but also, you know, how do you then deal with the issue of, of a Huawei type company or a Chinese government underway in that, you know, uh, interactive open network like what what it, how would how would they possibly not be in there too in that sense and how would you then deal with that security challenge again i'm not you know i'd leave that to uh maybe for another time but i this are just questions that i wonder thank you very much and thanks very much Charles. yeah so thank you to all of you i think we went a bit over time but that was all because of the delay at the beginning so thank you very much charles Didi Yerker, and others who joined us uh, this this um, this clip will be online on youtube and we'll be sending the full report written by charles barton around as well so it's already public so thanks again and i think we'll have many other discussions on this topic in the future so thank you very, thank you very much thanks everybody bye, bye.